Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're going to hear about some fast and furious filmmaking. The Seattle International Film Festival's Fly Filmmaking Challenge happens in the spring when selected local filmmakers race to complete short films with very limited time and resources. Those films then premiere at the Seattle International Film Festival. Amy Lillard of Washington Filmworks is the producer of this event, and Brad Wilkie is a UW filmmaker and Fly Film participant. Welcome, Amy. And welcome, Brad. Thanks for being here on Backstory. So let's go back and talk about the origination first, Amy, of Fly Films. Where did it come from? How was it conceived? What was the idea behind turning this into a program for local filmmakers? Well, um, you know, this has been a program that has had a long life okay. at the Seattle International Film Festival, and I've actually been involved since 2003. Okay. And really the heart and soul behind the program is about, you know, if you give um, the resources to make a film to a filmmaker, mm -hmm. along with some very creative limitations, what can they do within those confines? Mm -hmm. And it's not about competition, it's about talent and bringing that talent to the big screen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a wonderful opportunity because um, they make a film and then that film gets exhibited at yeah. the festival. So there's automatic distribution in it and that's just, you know, it, it really is a showcase for the talent that we have in our community. Uh -huh. And so at some point in time, someone sat down and said, we have got to use our resources at SIF to promote, create energy, a movement forward in the local filmmaking community. Uh, how does Washington Filmworks work and in, uh, fit into this? Mm -hmm. So I, I started producing the Fly Films in 2003, and I did so for six years, mm -hmm. 2003 to 2008. Mm -hmm. um, in 2009, a woman by the name of Virginia Bogart mm -hmm. um, stepped in and, and did it. They went on hiatus in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, in 2011, the festival knows that I have such a deep love for this program. And it seemed to make sense because Washington Filmworks is um, the private nonprofit that manages the state film program. Okay. And then we are all about facilitating production. Got it. And SIF at their core is about exhibition. So right. it seemed to be a good partnership. Okay. Was this a response to a demand? Was this, I mean, you know, when we were uh, setting up the show before, we talked a little about, you know, this idea of the moment. And what I mean by that is, you know, this show backstory, this this uh, sort of uh, notion that there is enough, that there is a growing uh, uh, population, a community, a culture of cinema in the city. Is it just something that you know, came about because the time was right? It was time to take that uh, energy and move it forward? Why now? Why, you know, what, what is the thing that sort of drives this idea for all of us here? What's really interesting is before I was involved with the program, when it first launched, mm -hmm. and this was over 10 years ago, yeah. they actually brought directors up from Los Angeles. So it began as out of town people mm -hmm. coming here to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then suddenly there was a decision, wait a minute, this would be better if it was local people. And I think there was a recognition on you know the executives at SIF that uh -huh. there was this amazing creative capital within the city. And um, I don't think that they've ever looked back. I mean, okay. we've seen this program really, I, I feel like this program, when audiences go see it, really they discover people. Uh -huh. And then, you know, if you, you can talk about any number of filmmakers who have come through the program, but, you know, they discover them here and they go on to do great things. Okay. So. Now, Brad, you lived through the paradigm <laughs> of fly. Yes. So let me see if I get this right. Four days to prep, three days to shoot, three days to post, boom, it's in front of an audience. Yeah, pretty much. That, that sums it up. <laughs> it, and I think <laughs> one, of the, one of the great elements of that process yeah. is the collaborative nature of okay. it. And I think what it is is a, a real bonding experience for the Seattle film community because it's not just the filmmakers who are uh, producing these films. Yeah. It, it's, it's a group, you know, it's a, a collaborative effort. So you have your cinematographer, you have your production designers, you have all the actors that are involved, uh, all, the, all the people that are behind the scenes, and when you go through something that that is, is so intense yeah. of that process, you know, three days to shoot this, you know, editing and things are breaking down and you have to, mm -hmm. you know, work within these constraints that have been set, which, you know, I really think, you know, sort of foments a additional creativity and, and it makes you really think beyond, you know, what's just in front of you and sort of what's next and what's next. So when you come to it as a filmmaker, are you saying you don't already have all those elements in place in terms of production, crew, talent, uh, the script and everything? Really, 
Washington Filmworks and SIF help facilitate bringing people together to make this happen? Yeah, it varies, I think, from year to year. Each year there's different constraints okay. and you know, it's set up. So the year that I did it, we worked with a screenwriter. Okay. So we selected a script that was already written that had come through a, a contest, I believe is how, how it worked. And then with that screenwriter, we developed the final script that we were going to shoot. Mm -hmm. And then it was our responsibility working with uh, Amy and, mm -hmm. and Sif mm -hmm. to, to pull together uh, the resources. So, mm -hmm. you know, th they worked with uh, Victory Studios mm -hmm. and uh, Modern Digital. Right, and to bring together the resources camera. to make it happen. You know, there was all, all, all these moving parts that were together. But, you know, when it came down to it, it was the filmmaker and the crew okay. that put this together. And like I said, it was a real bonding experience. Okay. And the, cre uh, the creative constraints that we talk about are always um, meant to contain the film yes. so that they're manageable. Yes. But really, um, I think we pride ourselves on them not being limitations in the yeah. traditional sense. Form and content. It's always an interesting balance, right? Mm -hmm. Form <laughs> oftentimes is what makes freedom and creative mm -hmm. freedom happen. Mm -hmm. It must be that every year it gets more diverse and more interesting to see how people handle these, uh, the parameters of making the films. It's, it's absolutely true. And what I love too is when you read the scripts, yeah. it, you know, what comes on the screen is so amazing. It could be diametrically different mm -hmm. or it could be you know, a strict interpretation. It really is an amazing program. Well, Brad, can you talk a little bit about that? Because you lived this four days, three days, three days, this idea of taking it from the page to the screen in that amount of time, what was the single most challenging element of that? Uh, I would, you know, say that it, my uh, my year the the main constraint was that we had to have a shot, an image of the space needle. So it was pretty uh, uh -huh. pretty pretty simple. Like you know, like they were really making it easy on us. So I thought, you know, well that might be a little too easy. I should really uh, make this more difficult and yes. uh, involve uh, foreign language. We did it. Part of it in Mandarin Chinese. Yes, and we had subtitles as Amy and I were just yeah, reminiscing yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. You know, really uh, brought the uh, the level of difficulty up a little bit. But uh, it was really it was great. It was like I said before, really collaborative and working from a script uh, by Peter Vogt. Mm -hmm. uh, he and I uh, developed it to a point that you know we we're happy. Like, all right, let, you know, let's shoot this, and then you know from there it was just a matter of you know interpreting you know what we had had come up with in the. Uh, in the development process. So. Uh, so while you're working on, I mean, literally you say pre-production four days, but are you telling me also the script is written in that time? Uh, in, in my case, the script was written uh, before okay, so the process. So, so you're doing the pre-production work, locations, crew, logistics, costume, lighting, how many setups you're going to do a day. That's really what you're concentrating on in those four days. Yeah. And it, then you literally shoot the entire film in three. And I'm going to guess those weren't three little, simple, six, eight-hour days, were they? <laughs> no. Un <laughs> unfortunately for the uh, cast and crew, they were more 16 to 18-hour days, days, I think it was. And um, we shot the, the majority of the film at Bush Garden yes. in, in the ID. So and you lived there for three days. Yeah. Ba basically, <laughs> we took over their uh, main dining room in, right. the, in the lounge from probably 7 in the morning on a Sunday yeah. until 3 in the afternoon when they had to get it ready for... Uh, Diner, so. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm going to presume that the editing room was no less frantic in the final three days after the shoot. Yes, not at all. And I actually have a, a funny story. I think I told Amy this before, but I think about halfway into the first day of editing, I spilled a drink on my laptop uh, probably at Perfect. 2 in the morning. Perfect. So I had to uh, replace the, uh, you know, get the footage off of the hard drive. I think you had to find a, a new computer that I edited in one of the offices at SIF. So, it, you know, really, I, I don't know if that was one of the constraints that we had put in there. Uh, <laughs> re, re, pla replace the hard drive in, in the, the middle of drive. the uh, editing process. But Nothing like the 2 a.m. phone call, right? <laughs> no, perfect. Perfect. It just adds to the drama. Yeah, but it was, you know, a wonderful experience. And like I said, you know, it was really a, a great bonding experience, mm -hmm. I think, for the different crews that were involved in the, the four films uh, of my year. Mm -hmm. I think it, you know, I still... I'm in touch with the different groups and you know, developed a lot of friendships Great. You know, out of that process. So. so tell me, in four days of prep, three days of shooting, three days of post, are you telling me you also learned to speak Mandarin Chinese during that time? <laughs> no, that's a great question. I, <laughs> I, I did not, but uh, we were really uh, adamant in the casting process okay. about finding actors who did speak Mandarin and Chinese. And did you have to do that casting within that time frame as well? Yes. So. <laughs> 
Wow. Like I said, I think we you know, kind of made it a little bit more difficult for ourselves than just in, in including a, a shot of the Space Needle. Yeah. <laughs> and so how did you go about doing that in such a short period of time? I mean, who do you, who do you lift up the phone and call and go, listen, I got to do this film. This is my script. These are the actors I need. Who do you talk to? Yeah, well, uh, in this case, I got in touch with Roger Tang, who's, uh, you know, uh, been around okay. the acting scene for quite a while here okay. in Seattle and has a group called the Portfield Players. Okay. That, you know, it's an improv group. And, you know, I, I asked him, he, he's actually in a scene that we ended up cutting from okay. the, the actual film. But, um, you know, he, he helped us get in touch with some actors that would be able to, f you know, play those roles and uh, realistically and believably right. speak, right. you know, Mandarin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I speak Mandarin, so I can attest to that. It was pretty, <laughs> I had no problem Good. <laughs> with it. I didn't actually need the subtitles, <laughs> which, was, which was kind of cool, and that, that lends a wonderful international sort of feel to the piece. So these fly films, Amy, it seems to me like they're more than just uh, events where the, the challenge is met and the filmmakers uh, indeed can uh, be satisfied with what they've accomplished. But it seems like they're also stepping stones to more later on. Brad already touched on that when he said he's in touch with the people he worked on. He's thinking about working on more projects. Uh, how do you see that as part of the mission of Fly Films? Well, it is, it's a springboard, I would say, more than anything else. I mean, all of the, all of the constraints, you know, the goal for everyone is that they make a great film. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the films that have come through the challenge have mm -hmm. gone on to play, you know, at the Palm Springs Short Film Festival in Tribeca and, you know, Claremont Ferrand. So, really amazing stuff. But then, you know, it's interesting because you see the filmmakers historically who have, you know, been in our program go on to do feature films, uh -huh. for example. Um, you know, Fly Film alums would be Lynn Shelton, yes. who had, you know, her current claim to fame is Hump Day from Sundance. Yep. Um, a, an episode of Mad Men Now. Yep. Um, down mm -hmm. out of L.A. Um, John Jeffcoat is mm -hmm. another really great example. He did a movie called Outsourced, mm -hmm. which now the NBC series yes. um, is based off of. Yes. So, really, it is part of their repertoire and their resume. And um, I think Sif and, you know, certainly me personally, we take great pride in that. So is this really, um, it's, it's a uh, crucible, if you will, in a positive sense uh, of the word, to really jumpstart local filmmaking. And it looks like it's paying off. Um, what's the future? Because you said it evolved from first it being people that came from out of town, then it has shifted to mm -hmm. uh, uh, in town, and you have these parameters. What are you all thinking about in terms of the evolution of it? Is it, is, is it a perfect model now? Does it need to be left alone and go on? Or are there ideas that are coming up that like, what could we do to augment uh, what's happening in the fly film experience? Well, there's no lack of talent, I will say that. You know, each year there's a group of people who nominate filmmakers and then, you know, we look at reels. Yes. Um, so there's lots of people still on that list. Uh -huh. Um, I think that the challenge will continue to evolve mm -hmm. in terms of what the creative constraints are. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as long as the vendors who donate everything to yes. this program from start to finish and the filmmakers are up, yes. you know, I'd love to see it continue. Well, can you tell us a little bit about this year's films? Just give us yes. a little sneak into what we're going to see this year. Yes. Uh, so we have three narrative films this year, and uh, there were f there were flies in the ointment, as mm -hmm. we call them. Mm -hmm. um, each filmmaker chose their lead character out of a hat. Aha. And so, for example, I know S.J. Chiro, who's one of our filmmakers this year, she chose um, Superhero, so you can look forward to that. Okay. Um, they were also introduced to uh, their location, which is a new production space down in Burien okay. um, called the Production Shop. Okay. And two of their three days of filming had to take place in that. And tell us about that location. It's, it's, a, it's a soundstage? It, it is. And, um, you know, it's very eclectic. Yes. It's an old garage. Yes. You know, there's everything from a diner scene to phone booths to um, a car lift, which I happened to put off limits this year because I <laughs> didn't think that was a good idea. Um, but a really eclectic, interesting, vibrant, creative space. So, so the parameters are, I'm hearing, they're set up. Uh, both in a sense that uh, are whimsical in order to promote imaginative storytelling, but also practical in that you are building connections and bringing together elements in the community. What's the process behind coming up with the parameters every year? 
Well, there's a little anecdote there, actually. Okay. There was one year um, where Lisa Hardmeyer had done a really beautiful film, and I went to go visit the set, and they were um, tying an actor to pretend to jump off of a bridge, okay. and I was like, that's it. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we have <laughs> got to. Okay. You know, the actor is like hanging off the side of the yeah. bridge, and I was like, okay, you know what? So, um, you know, again, it's, you know, creating an environment where, A, the filmmaker can be inspired. Yes. Um, but that it's contained enough so that it's safe. Yes. Efficient and effective. Right. I mean, you, they really are fast and furious. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's important. And I think every year that we've done that, um, the films have been more successful than some other years. Sure. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to this year's films. I want to thank both of you, Brad Wilkie for, of Paul thank Weiser you. Label and uh, Amy Lillard of Washington Filmworks. It's been a pleasure. We're really looking forward to seeing what happens with Fly Films this year. And thank you for watching Backstory. I'm Andrew Tsao, and we'll see you again behind the scenes. Fly Films, oh, yes. Yeah, so.